Thanks very much, Jack. My dearest friend in professional life, friend of my family, but for Jack, I wouldn't have been able to have been afforded the opportunities for service and indeed the role model to measure up to the standards that Colonel Jack Brennan has set as a Marine and very close advisor, President Nixon, and to so many others, young Americans, you've had the good fortune to get close to the Brennan family. I have to say I, I want to add a special welcome to Sandy's and to Jack Brennan's, to each of you. And I say special because I think that today, at some level, and you were deciding what you wanted to do, you were reminded. Today is Veterans Day, a day when we honor all those going back 200 years who have answered the call, who have served our country with honor, sacrifice, the loss of life, separation from families, disruption of their lives to preserve our country and our way of life. And so you came here. You came here because you thought it important to acknowledge that kind of sacrifice and to nurture that tradition. For indeed, this generation, like all those before you, must continue to take the risks, send our young men and women into harm's way. And but for them, we stand to lose all of the fundamental values, blessings we all enjoy in this country. Sandy mentioned President Nixon, and implicit was his role as a veteran. Yes, born here, just a few yards away from here, raised in Southern California in college at Whittier, Went to law school and indeed, when World War II broke out, had begun a successful law practice. And yet, seeing the threat to our country, he volunteered, joined the Navy, and was shipped out to the South Pacific in the hottest areas of battle as we began to seek to roll back what had happened in Pearl Harbor Midway, Guam. He was assigned to Bougainville, one of the bloodiest areas of the South Pacific. And after being retaken, it became a transshipment center where hundreds, indeed thousands, of C 47s moved all of the beans, bullets, and band aids, and booze now and then to keep our troops supplied. He did a terrific job there, and yet it wasn't long before he wanted to get closer to the guns, closer to the action, and he asked to be transferred and moved. And he was sent to Green Island. Further up, the Marshalls, the Gilberts, and toward Japan, ultimately. He hadn't been there very long when he was exposed personally to the brutality and horror of war as when planes would come back, crash, burn, Lieutenant J.G. Nixon would be in the rescue parties that pulled pilots out of the planes and the wreckage and got them to aid stations and could see. Many had a ring on their finger pictures from home, kids, some didn't make it. 
You can't do that without carrying away a very deep understanding of what it means to ask young men and women to put their lives on the line. And that lesson was very, very close to his heart as he served 27 years later as the commander-in-chief of our country. And I can tell you, as Colonel Brennan could, on each occasion when there was very likely to be a need to send American forces into harm's way. The president never thought about that in a casual or romantic way. There's nothing, nothing romantic about battle. One of the hardest things he did was to write the letters and sign the letters and make the calls to moms and dads, wives, their sons didn't come home and their daughters. It wasn't easy for Richard Nixon to have even gone into the service in the first place. As you've gone through the museum, the library, you've seen the history of his own family raised in the Quaker tradition of Pacific doctrine. Indeed, his uncle had been a conscientious objector in World War I. And it wasn't easy for the president, as of a young volunteer, Lieutenant J.G., to leave his family, his mother, Quaker could not have been pleased about that, but he believed strongly until he died that when we have to deal with a brutal enemy that has no respect for, even understanding of pacifism, figures like Hitler, Tojo, Hirohito, Pacific statement has no impact. And consequently, there are some things you must fight for. What can we say about the current generation? Some of you in this audience today. Well, they are, you are, Ordinary Americans who do very extraordinary things. Young, old, Republican, Democrat, black, Asian, Latino. A melting pot that reflects so well what our country has stood for starting 400 years ago and then 237 years yesterday since we founded a Marine Corps, our young men and women have found through time the courage, the dedication, and for their mom and dad, the anguish to send them off to battle. Ordinary men and women who do extraordinary things again and again. I'll give you an example. <clears throat> David Ray was a hospital corpsman, second class in Vietnam. In 1968, he was killed on Vietnam on the battlefield. He served with particular distinction there. As you know, corpsmen, called doc because they are the medics, usually unarmed in battle, but charged with carrying their rucksack or setting up a primitive aid station in the heat of battle on the front lines. And as the battle is underway, an incoming mortar fire and artillery, 
and their colleagues began to fall here and there. Their job is to go and get them, pick them up, bring them back to the aid station, usually through withering fire. And that was the case with David Ray on that day in 1968, as it was. Near Phu Lok, in a region of Vietnam called An Hoa, came under fire by a, a reinforced North Vietnamese regiment. And as his colleagues began to fall here and there, he went from one to the other, carrying those he could. Indeed, before long, he came under fire himself and attacked by two of the North Vietnamese soldiers. He killed one, wounded the other, and was wounded himself for the first time. But he didn't stop. He continued to fight. Ultimately, he got back to his aid station carrying another wounded Marine on his back, put him down, tried to administer to him, put a tourniquet on, the fire coming in all around him still. He was out of ammunition, and as the grenade came in to the aid station, he could see that he was not going to be able to stop what he was doing, even to pull it up and throw it out. So he threw his body on the wounded Marine that he was tending. He died. An ordinary person doing extraordinary things. Second example of the same heroism Army specialist, Monica Brown, was still a teenager when she went out on a patrol in Afghanistan in 2007. Her army platoon was under fire in a battle that lasted several hours. Her vehicle was hit right away and three of her colleagues were inside. It caught fire. And in the next terrorizing minutes, Monica, a petite young woman with body armor on, was the only one still conscious, and yet she managed to pull all of her con comrades, con comrades out of that Humvee, pulled them away before it exploded, saved their lives. Just an ordinary woman doing extraordinary things. Yes, it is our armed forces that carry the great burden of keeping us safe, free. We are blessed today to have the finest military in the world it has become better and better and better, and indeed, since the all-volunteer force put into effect in President Nixon's administration, we truly have the best and the brightest ordinary Americans we've ever had. There is a tendency, there is a risk, a real danger that we can in our society become removed from having to think about war because for 90% of all Americans, they'll never have to serve. That's true. No more than 10% of the young men and women in our country will ever have to serve, have to volunteer, or be able to volunteer. And the other 90% can become, if not indifferent, at least not sufficiently conscious to keep on your mind what these young men and women are doing. And every now and then to ask yourself, why do they do that? Why would you go into places that are so primitive, backward, do we really have anything at stake? Is it worth it? 
Why do we have to do this? Ask a veteran. Ask a child that's come home from Afghanistan. How was it? And you begin to hear how profoundly different it is. That tribal conditions are different. There are no primaries. There are no elections. There are hierarchies of tribalism in societies scarcely worthy of that name, with no accountability of the tribal chief to the people in the tribe. And these countries are struggling. And we've seen the number of them yearning, struggling, trying someday to aspire to be and to have what we have in our country. We take the rule of law for granted. We have rules in this country. The Constitution and a well-developed set of limits for human behavior. And it enables us, as free people, to do darn near anything we want, which is a blessing. If you can go to the school, any school you want, become whatever you want to be, it leads to innovation and to discovery and to what has made our country great. It doesn't happen in Afghanistan. It doesn't happen in Iraq or most of North Africa, indeed, two-thirds of the world. What a blessing. And so when you see a veteran go off, don't think they do it for the money. They've thought about the difference. When they come home, they can tell you how different it is. No, there are no courthouses. Indeed, there's no law. And because I know that, because I've been there and I've done that, when they come home, they say, Mom, Dad, don't take this for granted. We tend to think it can't happen again, that horrific wars of the 20th century surely couldn't happen again. We've become civilized, right? Well, that's what people thought in Germany in the 1930s. When religious German people acquiesced, indeed supported the rise of fascism, we've seen it happen again in Marxist, Leninist, Soviet Union, where very, very well educated people were seduced by the rhetoric of Leninist, Marxist brutality. Today, we're hearing it from different sources, but no less fascist, brutal, tyrannical. This time coming from radical Islamist, a tiny minority of Islam, truly. But a tiny minority that denies the legitimacy of any other way to worship, even among Muslims, than their own narrow extremist doctrine. It happened in Germany. It happened in the Soviet Union and Eastern Europe. Fascism, communism, Leninism, and today, Islamism, well-financed, well-armed, well-trained, powerful foe. It could come here. Because we are a free country, we honor freedom, we cherish it. But it isn't free. Think about that. Tonight, and every night when you gather for dinner, pray. Think about it. 
You see a veteran, a young man or woman, thank them. We are so blessed. Honor them. Love them. God bless them.